Singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog, where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. If you guys enjoy the show, you can help me make it better in one of several ways. You can leave a comment, you can click the like button on YouTube, or you can simply go to my blog and make a donation. As always, I will be the man with the questions, and today, the man with the answers is Zoltan Istvan. Zoltan is an award-winning journalist, volcano boarder, entrepreneur, and most recently, author of The Transhumanist Wager. Welcome, Zoltan. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. I'm really happy that uh, you managed to find time to be with us today. So let's jump right in. Tell us, what is The Transhumanist Wager? Well, it's a novel uh, specifically about the future, and it uh, brings forth a, a bunch of uh, interesting ethical questions about uh, transhumanism and what technology will uh, end up doing uh, to our species. Mm-hmm. And as you know, uh, my alias is Socrates, so I'm all about ethics and, and philosophy and, and mixing those ideas with the ways that our society is changing due to the exponential growth in technology. Uh, but going beyond the book title, what is in actuality the meaning of a transhumanist wager? What do you mean by that? Well, I believe that every human being on the planet, especially in the uh, 21st century, faces a, a real choice. Uh, with technology and science growing um, exponentially and so quickly, many of us living today may not need to die anymore. And the transhumanist wager is really uh, a kind of a, a choice between whether we want to promote that type of idea of living forever or whether we want to um, accept death as, as kind of a uh, a part of our destiny, or just a part of the way the, the species wa has evolved. And uh, the wager essentially says that you have that choice with technology improving so quickly, and in 10, 20, maybe 30 years, that choice will become very relevant. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So before we dive a little deeper into the meat of the matter here, I want to find out how and why you got interested in transhumanism in the first place. Well, when I was uh, studying in an English class uh, at Columbia University, um, there was a uh, open discussion in the in the Time magazine. There was a uh, article on uh, cryonics, and it was my real first introduction. I was, I think, 20 years old to the whole concept of transhumanism, of living forever, of being being brought back from the dead. And uh, upon reading that article, I don't know. Some people have light switches, but this was a light switch for me. I read that article, and I was. Uh, I, I converted and believed, and I now have dedicated, you know, a solid 20 years to reading and thinking and just embracing that fact that we can use science and technology to live much longer and hopefully reach uh, a point when um, our lives will no longer end, and also we can move beyond just being human and go into something much more incredible, something much more advanced and complex. Mm -hmm. And so then... Why did you decide to write a book about transhumanism? I mean, not all people interested in transhumanism make the next step up mm. and decide to write a novel about it. Well, the goal with the novel, as I looked at the uh, the kind of uh, the transhuman arena and what's going on, and there's there's many incredible scientists, many incredible philosophers, many incredible uh thinkers and futurists that are dedicated already to the field, but I have not seen that much in the way of art dedicated to the field. And uh, being inclined towards writing and uh, being a journalist, about 10 years ago, I began getting the idea that it would be great to write a, a kind of an epic about the struggle of trying to achieve immortality and embracing all the different facets of the movement itself. And... Um, about four or five years ago, I finally got the time and space to actually sit down and dedicate a couple of years to just uh, working out a, a, an artistic uh, statement that would really uh, put forth uh, the, the dilemmas, the challenges, the controversies uh, into a novel form. And my goal was really to try to give that into the hands of a younger generation 
so that they can um, begin to embrace and not see transhumanism as some type of, uh, you know, uh, science fiction, you know, movie or uh, infotainment or something like that, but to see it as something that's real. They can dedicate their careers. They can dedicate their minds. They can dedicate their resources to uh, these concepts. And I'm hoping that that's where the novel will hit strongest is with that group of people that will then uh, uh, rise up and kind of dedicate uh, much more of their uh, time and uh, thoughts to uh, our goals. So it sounds like the book has been festering for over 10 years now or for at least 10 years. Absolutely. Um, at least 10 years. I would say closer to 15, but uh, the novel, the concepts, uh, uh, some of the, the scenes that you might know from the novel have already been well established for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move on with the main protagonist here in your book. Uh, his name is Jethro Knights. So can you tell us a little bit more about him? Who is Jethro Knights? Well, Jethro Knights is the main character of the novel, and it's really him who presents the transhumanist wager as a, as a concept for hopefully every person to embrace and say, well, this is a choice that I must make. And in that choice, I also must dedicate much of my energy uh, in life towards it. And, you know, as, as any novel develops, you try to create scenarios where that uh, character is challenged, where his uh, ideas are broken down, where, uh, you know, uh, any kind of crisis will happen to him that essentially will keep the reader interested in him. And, um, and the story is essentially of his life from an early age all the way towards the end um, of the book. Now, Jethro is a very controversial character in the book, and there is a variety of uh, ways uh, uh, that people perceive him. Uh, some of them called him monstrous, immoral, and inhuman. Um, how do you feel about him? <laughs> <laughs> the tough question. <clears throat> well, obviously, I, I really deeply respect and uh, like Jethro Knight, and uh, that's why I created him as the main character. However, it, it's important, you know, as an artist, at least in my opinion, to paint extremes for the readers. Uh, one tries to go out of their way to paint the far left side and one paint the far right side and hopefully readers in the middle will come to appreciate uh, the places sometimes where he stands sometimes where he doesn't sometimes they hate him I've had enough of my uh, hate email in the last uh, few weeks from from the book um, but I, I, I'm, I have formed Jethro after many of my own ideas and not all of them but many of them and I have thought long about lots of those ideas, pushing myself to try to understand whether I was correct and whether I wasn't correct. And uh, in that way, I, I really like him and want to defend him and support him, even though I realize that on the, at least at first glance, most people really are going to dislike him. Even people that like the book end up really disliking him. So is Jethro someone you aspire to become? Well, as an artist, I don't believe the character of Jethro is necessarily reachable. You know, we paint these pictures as novelists in such scenarios where it probably, a set of circumstances like that would never occur. However, if such a set of circumstances did occur, would I want to achieve some of these things? Well, some of these things for sure. Uh, some of the more extreme things, those are definitely questionable. Do I have that type of courage and integrity? I don't know. It's as an artist, it's always easy to paint that picture. It's not so easy to live that picture, mm -hmm. and uh, so I, I can't fully be on board with him. However, I can say that there are things about him, many things that I would highly aspire to, and perhaps he's right about everything. I just, inside my own self, have not uh, reached mm -hmm. as a human being who you know feels love, feels care, much more so than I think Jethro would. Mm -hmm. Because what was striking to me is that, you know, after I read your biography, there's um, almost infinite amounts of similarities. I mean, 
going beyond the looks, which I think are very similar at, at the very least, but but also, uh, you know, he was a journalist just like you are. He took a, an around-the-world trip with 500 books on a boat just like you, you did. Uh, his wife was a, a medical doctor just like yours. Um, he had uh, war experiences in Kashmir, and you got uh, an award-winning uh, for journalism uh, for your experiences there. And one of the crucial key points, turning points in, in the novel is uh, when Jethro steps on a landmine which doesn't explode, which fails to ignite. And you yourself admit that you had this life-changing experience yourself. So, I mean, how much of him is reality and, and, or autobiographical? Well, you know, the first third of the book is quite autobiographical, of course. Um, and certainly some of the uh, the cashmere uh, stuff is taken verbatim. I mean, even I think the uh, article in the uh, the book, the short snippet of it, is taken directly from one of the National Geographic articles. Um, however, you know, two-thirds of the book really is not about anything about me. It's more the idealized version of where a character might go under a certain set of circumstances. And, you know, I didn't mean to make Jethro look my, like me. They just... Actually, when you read books, you realize there's not that many uh, blonde characters. And so there were some other, you know, thematic differences for why I chose that, as opposed to just trying to picture it off me. I really did not mean to do that. He, he started off as, a, uh, as a, uh, a character with black hair and black eyes. And then I realized that every science fiction movie had that same kind of character. So uh, I thought I'd pick something a little bit uh, more unusual. And um, so while there are similarities... Um, certainly there are differences, and of course the similarities are pretty prevalent in the very first third of the book, and then later they just really drop off. Mm -hmm. and, and so for, for Jethro, that moment of the unexploded, uh, unexploded landmine, which in, in the novel is in Congo, actually is a life-altering experience. Now, your experience actually, if I'm not mistaken, happened in Vietnam? Yes, that's right. So how life-altering was that for you, and in what way, if it was? So my experience was slightly different than Jethro's. I never actually stepped on a landmine. One of my guides, as I was stepping, pushed me, and I fell down and missed the landmine. But I just kind of sat there, and he pointed at it, this metal object sticking out of the ground, as we were doing a film video, and, and I just sort of sat there you know, for a whole solid two minutes, realizing that this was this was this was very real and uh, sometimes as a journalist tromping around the jungles and filming all sorts of incredible things you forget that it's it's real and uh, it was an important revelation to me in the sense that uh, you know in an instant everything could have changed dramatically but uh, certainly that was that was at the very end of the four years I'd been with National Geographic. And after that, I did come home uh, to America, where I then stay, have stayed most of the time, except for a few other journalism assignments, and uh, have begun really working on the draft of the book. So it played a, a, a key role in kind of stimulating that, okay, let's not get killed. Let's go actually do something for yourself and the movement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, one of the... Let's move on to the larger thematic uh, uh, issues or the, the themes of the book. And one of the main ones is that of conflict. And uh, that's, of course, the potential or the actual conflict between transhumanists and anti-transhumanists. And um, I want to read a short passage of your book where you say, The conflict over transhumanism was straightforward. Futurists, technologists, and scientists touted transhuman fields like cryonics, cloning, artificial intelligence, bionics, stem cell therapy, robotics, and genetic engineering as their moral and evolutionary right, and as crucial future drivers of the new economy and an advancing cultural mindset in America. Opponents said transhumanism and its immortality mantra were antitheistic, immoral, not humanitarian, and steeped in blasphemous egoism. Others labeled it the world's most dangerous idea. So, do you really think that such extreme polarization and its consequent conflict is inevitable? 
I mean, there's a number of other people who have come up in the past in support of that argument. I mean, the former cyber terrorism uh, uh, leader, uh, Richard Clark, from the Bush administration, wrote a book called Breakpoint, where he talks precisely about that kind of a terrorist conflict. Uh, Dr. Hugo de Garris, who is a well-known uh, researcher in artificial intelligence, has his own concept of Terrans and Cosmists who come into conflict uh, as a result of that kind of a friction. So there's a number of people who have come out. And yet you have people like Ray Kurzweil who are perhaps underplaying the potential for conflict or at least prefer to focus on the positive side of things. Do you think that conflict is inevitable? Well, I would say today the conflict seems inevitable. Uh, I believe that the, you know, with a world that is still 90, 95% religious, at some point they will say this has gone too far. This really violates most of our most basic codes. And um, I just don't think a lot of them have realized that right now. However, on the other hand, there's this other... Uh, thing happening, and that's that a whole younger generation all around the world is coming up and uh, getting older, and they no longer feel such conflict uh, with religion. They embrace it. There's, there's a lot of uh, mismatch, uh, mixing and matching and this kind of stuff going on where they just take it in stride. And if the older generation passes on and the newer generation comes up, I do not see such a conflict happening. However, if the older generation is able to uh, stay alive and hold on to those uh, that kind of vehement uh, attitude, then I believe the conflict will be very, uh, very severe. And I think we will see a point when um, you will see so much division between the two that you could almost call it another uh, civil rights uh, conflict uh, in across the major, uh, you know, countries of the world. Yeah, you you see you say that actually in the book almost verbatim, and I it's one of the things that I've highlighted. But uh, while I could agree that that may be sort of a higher potentiality in in the United States of America, uh, from the point of view of the Canadian experience or the Western European experience, where religion is at record low, I think it's highly unlikely personally outside of the USA. Uh, in Canada, we have a record low attendance of church uh, and, and even uh, in other religious institutions, and the same applies to places even like France who have you know, centuries-old Catholic traditions and so on, Britain, uh, Germany, and, and even the people who are um, attending church on a regular basis seem to become more and more tolerant uh, with controversial issues such as, for example, uh, women clergy or gay marriage, etc. Well, and <laughs> I fully agree with you. You know, outside America is a funny place. Let's just be honest. <laughs> Who knows what's going on here? You, you know, so many people in the middle of the country really have some very strong attitudes. And uh, frankly, I have been getting some emails from them recently, and uh, they're not the kinds that are pleasing. Um, and they obviously don't like the ideas in my my book, and uh, and they're not obviously don't like me as well. I'm hoping, as you know, as you've just mentioned, that America will follow in the footsteps of the rest of uh, the world. I, it's hard for me to imagine China actually being against transhumanism. Yeah. They seem so with it when it comes to just moving forward and accepting progress and in stride. They're the um, champions. It looks like right now. And of India course. is not too far behind, it seems, too. Of course, of course. And, um, you know, as, as India and China also become um, more global players in, in economic terms, um, that will probably take more precedence. And hopefully America will slowly accept what I believe is probably an inevitable fact, that these things, uh, the, the transhumanism will eventually uh, succeed. And, uh, and also, you know, people will start saying, wow, it makes a lot more sense. You know, for purposes of the book, though, to create a, an exciting story and to also just create a, a potentiality what might happen. Um, you know, I have painted extremes and, and created a conflict of civil rights and, uh, and clearly, uh, it is improving. However, uh, one never knows. It, it could just, uh, ferment up and all of a sudden we could be in a, a big problem in the middle of, uh, 
America as people say, no, this is unacceptable. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But I agree with you. We are going a, a direction that is encouraging and the rest of the world is leading us there, mm-hmm. not America. So, so let me share with you sort of my point of view here a little bit and you tell me what you think because I was planning to do it a little bit later, but I think now might be a more appropriate time because you said that you painted the extremes for artistic purposes and sort of to make the book more interesting and create the context of the plot. But my criticism towards you is that I think it could have been done a little bit more sophisticated. And here's the, the full, my full take on it. So I love the beginning of the book and kind of hated the end very much. Uh, and on the one hand, and so I, I'm kind of conflicted. On the one hand, the book is philosophically speaking, very sophisticated. You can see clear influences from Plato's Republic, from Nietzsche's Overman or Ubermensch, from Thomas Moore's Utopia, and from a number of Eastern and Western philosophies. On the other hand, it is kind of simplistic in its sort of an Atlas Shrug type of a plot, which I would call, in which, you know, the government is like the arch evil, and then the, the, the lone hero <laughs> changes the world, sort of, uh, who goes against the government. What do you say about that kind of a criticism? Well, I believe from an artistic perspective, um, it is sometimes easiest to get one's message across when they paint simple strokes so that someone can approach it who doesn't know anything about transhumanism. And I told you this in my emails. Uh, much of the book is actually uh, repetitive for transhumanists, redundant for them. They know what's going on. They don't need. They, they made the choice about the wager a long time ago. And the book was really written for the person who um, has not thought about these things, who has thought the word transhumanism means something science fiction, maybe some movie that they saw 10 years ago. The, the book was written to paint simple strokes to take people who have not thought about it and say, hey, this is happening, this is real, and uh, I would like you to think about it and to make your own choices so that you can uh, hopefully pursue um, the mindset, the cultural mindset that will be coming in the next 10 to 20 to 30 years because of technology and science improving so quickly. And that's why I specifically have painted something that is uh, – <clears throat> easy to understand and somewhat black and white in its uh, in its um, kind of agenda. If I was writing a book simply for transhumanists, I would have made something much more complex. There would have been a lot more, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, character development and looking into the science and some of the other things. But this was really designed for someone who had not read much about the book, uh, not read much about the ideas, and was looking for something to get interested in it and also to have something artistic so they didn't have to, uh, you know, um, dig down into a 400-page science manual to find out about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So another tough question that I could perhaps uh, pose here is, um, you know, I think Max Moore called your book um, The Atlas Shrugged of, Shrugged of Transhumanism. And I, I think I, I, I can say that this is a fair description in some ways, but it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, some people who love Ayn Rand and her work would naturally gravitate towards reading your book. On the other hand, people like me who really detest her work would naturally be repulsed. <laughs> so were you aware or what's the sort of interplay between your book and Atlas Shrugged? Well, to begin with, you know, I have been influenced by objectivism um, quite a bit through the years. However, I, I want to say that, you know, Atlas Shrugged is by no means a favorite book of mine. Uh, I, I'm not that fond of it, actually. Uh, I'm much more a fountain, the Fountainhead type of guy, which is one of her first books. And the reason I like that book so much is because it talks about the integrity of the artist and the integrity of a human being standing up for his rights and just simply fighting for them. Um, and I understand some of the elements about the shrug are also in my uh, book. 
you know, most of the objectivists that I have tried to get to read the book have 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 really been against it. Of course, there's no improving on her on Ayn Rand's philosophy, <laughs> and if you try to do that, you get in trouble. <laughs> Even though I said, well, you know, 30 years of we're you know robots with artificial intelligence, maybe a new ethical system will be necessary. In fact, of course, a new ethical system Absolutely. will be necessary, and they disagree with that. However, um. You know, it, it's true that I have incorporated a few elements, and I've tried to improve on many of those elements. Um, but I can tell you, as you noticed right away, that even mentioning uh, uh, Atlas Shrugged in the context of my book at this point has done nothing for me, at least nothing good. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, while well, Atlas Shrugged remains one of the best sellers uh, today in the long term, yeah. uh, I'm not sure it's actually winning anyone over in the meantime, as I uh, probably just contributes to the hate email. Now, speaking with uh, uh, on about uh, um, disagreements with some of the elements of objectivism, uh, I, I've had previous guests on my show where I've argued that you know it only makes sense, at least to me, that when we change our socio-political economic system, you know, after the birth of artificial intelligence and all the other exponentially growing technologies that are developing today, it only makes sense that capitalism would go obsolete, just like all other previous economic systems. And, you know, notable economists such as Robin Hanson, for example, and others have absolutely disagreed with me. (laughs) What's your view on on that? Well, this gets a little bit outside of my expertise, so uh, now I'm sort of winging it. Um, But my guess is that... uh, there has to be some element of competition in the system, regardless of what happens. And whether that uh, remains a, uh, a capitalistic endeavor, at least in economic forums, uh, is, is yet to be seen. But I, I do believe that we, it is in our best nature, and it is uh, the main driver of evolution to compete. And so I believe whatever system we create, there must be that element in it for us to um, at least advance as quickly as we are advancing. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be there. I'm just simply saying that um, I am believing that it is probably the best system for us evolving as quickly and efficiently as possible, which is, you know, one of my primary goals. Mm -hmm. So would you call yourself an objectivist? No, I definitely would not call myself an objectivist at Mm -hmm. this point. Because there's alternative views. And, and, you know, I have to admit that I myself also agree that there has to be an element of competition. That's my personal view, or bias if you want to call it that way. But there are other people, uh, for example, I'm currently working on an interview with Jacques Fresco, who believe that, uh, you know, we can have a future of cooperation, uh, where people are cooperating with each other rather than competing with each other. And, I mean... He puts forward a very strong argument about resource-based economy and all that, but his so-called Venus project. Uh, But one of the things that he described was his experience on an island uh, where the natives sort of lived in a post-scarcity environment where they had plenty of fish, plenty of food, plenty of fresh water, and and plenty of living space, and how when he went to the island and one day... Uh, he told them, oh, um, can we make a boat, uh, a canoe, because I want to go out, you know, with you. And then a couple of days later, they showed up and they gave him a canoe. And they said, you know, you can have this canoe and we don't want anything in return. But then another couple of weeks later, they came back and they took the canoe from him and they told him, you're not using it. (laughs) Because he actually didn't get to use it. And they're like, well... We've been see- noticing that you're n- you haven't been using it, so they took it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what do, you, what do you think of cooperation? Should there be an element, a, a greater element of cooperation in our future than the one that we're seeing right now? Because, I mean, you can make a very strong argument that much international conflict is based on scarcity. And with those exponentially growing technologies at least in many of those fields, we would be living in an environment of post-scarcity or abundance, and therefore competition perhaps in most fields or in some fields would be much less relevant and perhaps go extinct. Well, much of what you say I, I believe is accurate, and, and you know, I personally would love cooperation. That, that sounds wonderful to me. I mean, it's always sounded wonderful to me. 
I just don't see it as realistic given that I think the nature of a of human being is, is really to strive to be uh, the best, to be as powerful as they can become. And uh, in the, Let in me that stop you I, right here, though. If you're a good, uh, I, I consider myself transhumanist, and one of the reasons for that is that I refuse to acknowledge that there is a human nature. So when you tell me human nature, my first call is, where is it? Show me what it is. Give me the parameters. You know, I don't even know what my own personal nature is, let alone human nature. And I mean, we can, and that's, I think, what, isn't that one of the core beliefs of transhumanists, that we are a process, we're not, you know, an entity. We are constantly evolving. Therefore, there's nothing fixed. Well, I would say, you know, I would say, and I think Jethro Knight would also say that the one thing that is fixed is the reluctance to die or the reluctance to um, uh, live less well than could be otherwise. And I think in this sense, our, our primary motive in life is to rise, to evolve, to gain power and to uh, make our lives better. And generally, in the hierarchy of values, the breakdown usually ends up on the shoulders of just every single person on themselves, making that judgment for themselves, perhaps then for their family, perhaps then out to, to society and to their countries. And uh, that's how the breakdown of value, at least to me, usually um, applies. And I, I understand, I, I don't really like to necessarily say I'm human. I like to say I'm actually just a, a power of evolution. And uh, But I believe that evolution, it is... Uh, um, built into the core of what evolution is, is that we are advancing, we are improving, and that nature is the desire to get stronger, uh, more powerful, and to uh, keep kind of uh, going upwards towards whatever uh, we're going to become. Mm -hmm. And just to uh, confirm your words, um, I, one of the, the passages that I have highlighted in the book is where Jethro says, death must be conquered from now on, that is my first and foremost aim in life. That is the quint quintessential first goal of the transhumanist. So, and I have to say, I, I kind of agree with that. I agree with that very much, that uh, we well, have and, to overcome that. Yeah, and, and the, the main reason for that is because we can discuss things all day long, but if we're all going to die in 30, 40 years, yeah. it, it's somewhat, it just doesn't make that much of a difference. Yeah. I think once we get to a point when we have ongoing sentience, uh, we can then... Um, perhaps discuss more issues like cooperation and, uh, and other things so that the, uh, the entire system can uh, evolve uh, in, in a way that I think you and I would like to see, which is everyone's happy. Mm -hmm. However, um, in the meantime, uh, you know, my father had a heart attack at 51. I just turned 40. You know, time is ticking. I can feel it. I'm getting older and everyone else is too. And I feel like, um, as I say in my book, that oftentimes morality at least um, according to Jethro Knights, would be defined by the amount of time we have left to live. And that's how uh, either extreme or less extreme or complex it can get. Mm -hmm. That's actually a great thought. And I, I would definitely remember this, this, those words that you just said, that morality is oftentimes derived from the amount of time we have left. <laughs> that, that's, I like that a lot. Uh, now, one interesting thing that I noticed in your book is that on the one hand, you have the, the main protagonist, Jethro Knights, who is very sort of scientifically uh, transhuman. And uh, I mean, in one place in the book, you say Jethro felt he should be a genuine philosophical machine following the most expedient path to immortality. So I get that with him. But then on the other hand, you have the counterbalancing element of his better half, Zoe, who is very much what you call a transhuman spiritualist because she has very strong influences from Zen Buddhism in particular and generally Eastern mysticism. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Why did you decide to put that contrast and that sort of in interplay between the hardcore scientific transhumanism and the sort of mysticism of the East? Well, I, I believe, you know, my, my own personal philosophies are probably best represented by both Zoe and Jethro. And 
Zoe represents the confusion in my own mind about feeling this extreme about certain ideas and trying to put them forth, especially in public. And Zoe offers that uh, the tool, at least as an artist, and also, you know, that's perhaps why Jethro is so in love with her, is that uh, the ability to see another side that is um, kinder, uh, uh, another means that is perhaps better for everyone, um, and something that just I think we in general can feel is right, even though Jethro says statistically it makes no sense. And so Zoe comes into his life and plays that part of balancing him, the yin yang. And, uh, and, you know, at first he's like, ah, you know, I can't believe I'm in love with this person. But deeper into it, he, you know, he's in love with her because she represents many questions that he cannot answer. In fact, that I cannot answer still. And, uh, at some point I will be, um, working on a sequel and the sequel will involve Zoe coming back and, Jethro and Zoe really having it out and dis- and going as far as I can philosophically into the nature of love. And at what point does it really break down? At what point does one have to say, you know, this is something I can no longer do uh, when two machines, for example, are trying to interact? And, uh, you know, the, the nature of the book would not involve that right now. It just involved the, the, you know, letting the reader know that there are still many unanswered questions and Zoe does a great job of uh, presenting them to Jethro that he just simply can't answer. Mm-hmm. That kind of reminds me to Aristotle, I think, who said that true love can only exist not when two people are in love with each other, but when both in love with the same virtues. <laughs> so true. Very true. So let me ask you uh, another question here and uh, move on to the topic of the technological singularity. So in one place of the book you say the following, quote, Jethro Knights and every person in that conference center knew this was not about transhumanism, but about successfully navigating the possibility of a singularity, controlling artificial intelligence and merging with it once launched and not being destroyed by it, or left behind by it, or bedeviled by it. So basically, tell us a little bit more about the interplay between transhumanism and the technological singularity. Well, I, I want to say first that, you know, as much as the my novel tries to put forth um, a philosophy and an idea of a man overcoming immortality, it's also a warning. It's a very real warning about the ideas of what can happen to the human race, as brilliant as some of the uh, uh, concepts are that will happen from a transhumanist perspective, they're also highly dangerous. And uh, I know I don't need to tell any transhumanists that. So it's important that the, the book serves as a warning. And we take these challenges that are happening to us so quickly, incredibly seriously, because the last thing we want to do is uh, merge into something that we don't like. That would be, you know, then the whole point would be lost. So it's important that as we move towards the singularity, as we um, embrace uh, ever more transhumanistic cultural mindsets and lifestyles and uh, uh, ways of living, we um, take every precaution necessary to make sure that it is the direction that we really want to go. And I see it as incredibly dangerous. In fact, the transhumanist wager is really about achieving an ongoing sentience. Uh, as, as, as extreme as some of the ideas in the book may be about achieve, you know, achieving immortality, I think when Jethro would get to that, and, and of course in some other sequels he will, he will be much more cautious than I think most people would, uh, after reading the first book, would be led to believe. Because I personally realize that this is going to be so incredibly difficult to manage and handle that the greatest of care is going to have to uh, to um, go with it. I think achieving immortality, we just got to get there quickly and get there quickly now. But the idea of merging with technology and time and you know so much happening so much more quickly, uh, it, it's almost overwhelming to think about. And uh, and I am uh, uh, you know. I would like, in that sense, I would want to go very uh, cautiously and carefully. Of course, I want to do it 100%. I, I can't see anything more brilliant. But um, I definitely am more cautious than I think the book would lead one to believe um, when it comes to entering those final stages of perhaps where uh, a transhumanist will end up once the singularity or something of that nature actually takes place. So then you, you sort of see it a lot more likely that immortality will be accomplished along the, the lines of biology, at least initially 
with, say, uh, genetic engineering or synthetic biology or whatever, rather than uh, immortality being accomplished by us becoming, for example, mine uploads, for example? Well, I think from a cautionary point of view, if I was going to bet on how society would allow these changes to take place, I think most people would feel most comfortable with the biology becoming more advanced rather than the technology. Because that's what um, we know. That's what we're used with, too. Sure, sure. And I, and I, uh, however, you know, it's one of those things that once it's you... It's the least maybe, scary option. <laughs> it is exactly, that is precisely right. And so I think, you know, even though the book talks about downloading, you know, the main goal being getting into a machine, um, I realize from a real practical standpoint that uh, the biological one is the safer bet where we slowly take these steps to not uh, making sure we completely go down a path that we cannot reverse. Um, however, the adventurous side of me is attracted to going as far as we can as quickly as we can. And in that sense, the idea that um, we would um, entirely be amongst machines, entirely be amongst electrical signals, you know, it, it sounds wonderful. It's just, it's almost impossible for you and I to even talk about that kind of subject, as we don't even know the logic, the philosophies, the ethics, what language would it be? You know, it's such a different mindset. I think when we talk about biological immortality, we all understand more or less where we're going. We're going to, we're still going to be able to have this conversation. Um, we may not, it may not be the same thing. We're both inside machines. Mm -hmm. So let me just ask you the last question on this topic of the singularity here then. Do you think it is possible, probable, or inevitable? I think it's probable, and I think it's probable because there may be a number of factors that get in the way, and believe me, I want to say it's inevitable. I want to say it's inevitable, and I support it being inevitable. However, I, uh, I realize that there are many things against us. In fact, my book is uh, a book about, <laughs> about the rest of the world really saying, hey, th we, this cannot happen. This is going to violate virtually every code that many of us believe in. We or don't at least want your singularity. <laughs> Keep it. Yes, yes, exactly. We don't want your singularity. <laughs> um, however, I, and for that reason, I think it's probable. I do believe that transhumanists will uh, overcome anything that tries to get in their way. And I do believe they'll eventually um, march right into trying to embrace the singularity and go into it. Um, but I do not see it as necessarily something uh, inevitable. Uh, I feel it's going to be a struggle uh, to get everyone on board. And, and I think um, through that conflict, uh, some uh, great changes will have to take place, including a cultural mindset uh, of of much of how the, the globe views itself, how humanity views itself. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and in, in that sense, uh, so much can happen because if too many people say no, those too many people will likely win, and that probable, goes, probable then goes to maybe not anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, and you can perhaps tell us a little bit about transhumania. Well, transhumania is, is that concept I think that we all would dream of. This, this place, this city, uh, away from restrictions, from bureaucracy, away from government, away from anything that's ever gotten in the way of uh, anything that's ever stifled innovation, away from that. And where you are just amongst the greatest of friends. Uh, everyone thinks um, scientific thoughts. Everyone thinks innovation. Everywhere you look, something interesting and brilliant is happening. Uh, it's a dream, and you know, I put it in the book as the ideal that one could reach, especially as those people that are leaving are leaving because they are not happy where they're at, and they want more opportunity to do the things that they most want in their life. And so Transhumania was created as that ideal where you know, the best scientists and thinkers and futurists in the world could go live together, raise their families, and work towards conquering um, mortality and work towards you know, becoming truly transhuman. You know, I'm actually, one of my interviews, I have like 20 interviews that I'm working on to get the people to the show, but one of the ones that sort of I'm working on is, uh, and I don't want to give out too much details right now, but a, a group of people who are trying to buy an island and start a transhumanist community. <laughs> so what do you think of that? And I'm not talking about a novel, I'm not talking about fiction, I'm talking about goal with a 
specific group, and I hope to get them on my show soon. Uh, and they're very serious about it. Well, you know, I think something like that is wonderful. And ultimately, I never, you know, in real life, I believe that it wouldn't just be one transhumania. There would be a number of transhuman um, population centers where, you know, sort of like universities, where people just simply go and say, well, this is the general theme of this type of uh, community. And there's many of them. There's 10, there's 20, there's 30. And I wouldn't be surprised if pretty soon we start seeing universities saying, well, one of our main goals is to work towards this. And already, you know, we have certain scientific centers that in many ways, that's where the, what they're trying to do. And uh, so I think that kind of community is fantastic. And I would love to see more of them. And I would love to see a giant one. And who knows, maybe one day uh, it will become such a well-established trend that there will be, um, you know, <laughs> we'll all go on vacation to these places. Or to live there permanently. Or to, yeah, or to live there and work. Maybe you'll be, uh, you know, doing the interviews from the top of a skyscraper somewhere. <laughs> I wouldn't mind that, that's for sure. However, as we'll talk about in a little bit later, I wouldn't do it under all conditions. And under certain condition, conditions, I will be the first one to leave. So we'll talk about that in a second. But before that, let me ask you, from your own point of view, the transhumania you talk about in your book, is that a utopia? You know, utopias, dystopias, they, they all, you know, various forms of perfect societies or problem societies or whatever it is that we have, they have always kind of bothered me because I realize, you know, in the real world, it doesn't happen. Of course, as a novelist, I have created what, you know, most people will say is a utopia, and even I try to design it as a perfect place to go. Um, but I, so, well, I'll say to people, it's not so much a utopia as, in, as much as it is a collection of, of just a simple geographical place where everyone can go to get the work done that they need to do. And usually utopia means lifestyle, this and that. And of course, you know, I painted all the pictures of what transhumania is. But the core of transhumania is that people can work in peace. People can work without restriction. People can do their experiments and they, there's enough funding and, you know, they just don't need to worry about the day-to-day -day stuff in order to do uh, get the job done to uh, achieve immortality and move transhumanism forward. And um, that's more of a, a university-type idea to me than, let's say, a utopia. That's why they leave. It's not a community that they necessarily want to, uh, um, even though I think many would say, oh, we could stay here forever, um, I think they really don't want to be on transhumania. They had to go there to get their job done. Aren't there places who already do that today? Maybe small centers? I don't know. Like Singapore, perhaps Switzerland, northern Scandinavian Europe, sort of parts of Canada, maybe. I don't know. You've traveled way more than me. Well, and, and certainly there are places that, that are better than others, but I don't think, at least that I know, there is one single place that we can all go and say, ah, this feels like home. Um, and I mean, maybe Silicon Valley for me, uh, living here is, is one of the closest places that I can actually say that where I, you know, I drive down and see all the technology buildings and say, I just feel great here. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, th there's just not that many places that are so large and all encompassing where you would say, Oh, let's go there. And, uh, the whole family would agree that it's a wonderful place. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in that sense, transhumanity is this great ideal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to admit myself that uh, while I was at Singularity University in Silicon Valley for 10 weeks, I just, that that's the one place that I would love to be permanently. It's just, I love that place. It's so amazing. It's boiling. Things are happening there all the time. It's it's inspiring. It's, it's I, I just really love it. Um, is Transhumania the place that feels like home to you? Would you want to be a part of trans, a citizen of Transhumania? Absolutely, I would. I would love something exactly like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly like that. Well, not necessarily <laughs> exactly like that. I wouldn't want a circumstances when we ha when you know a group of scientists has to be ostracized from the rest of the world. But I would like a set of circumstances, sort of like you just described, the Singularity University, where everyone comes and goes, and what everyone is doing is so interesting and. Uh, I don't think uh, it's possible to get bored in a place like that. And, uh, and you know, one of my main 
goals in life is just to keep it as interesting as possible. Mm-hmm. And uh, in a place like that, you you know, you, it would be bored. That. Yeah. Yeah. If one thing you don't get enough time to sleep because there's so much cool stuff oh. happening all the time. <laughs> exactly. At least exactly. that was my biggest problem when I was there. I couldn't sleep because there's always something cool going on. Um, now, let me bring in a couple of elements that I personally would make a choice not to be a member of your transhumania and, and give you the reasons why. And my take on it is this. I probably, if I were to be a fictional character in your book, I would have probably fought all the way through to the very end and quit right at the victory parade. And the reason for that is this, and I, I, I want to read you a couple of passages and, and tell you what makes me very uncomfortable there. Our interpretation of values taught us that evolution and its ascent of technology do not operate off democratic principles, but off principles of might, of principles of survival. Transhumania will implement, a st- and, and I'm skipping passages, but I'm just going to give you a few. Transhumania will implement a strict worldwide family planning policy. People who can reasonably and successfully raise children will be allowed to procreate and encouraged to do so. All others will not be allowed to procreate. No pensions, no social security, no Medicare, public executions of criminals, police and military instructed to execute criminals on site if they were caught in illegal acts, curfews and martial law. So those for me, and I see how that's sort of the path that you have to go through and sort of the leadership that Jethro Knights takes our civilization through to get to that final point of transhumania. But for me personally, the cost is too high. Uh, the possibilities for corrupting the ideals are endless. Uh, and in that sense, I would call it utopian. Because in my personal experience, revolution is a bloodthirsty monster, as one of the French revolutionaries said. Once you let it out, you cannot easily stop it. And, you know, my own personal experience from the collapse in the, in the Eastern, the communist regimes in, in Bulgaria, for example, is that, you know, people come out on the street and change the government, but uh, and, and there's a revolution, but eventually someone ends up corrupting everything, you know. And that's happened with the French Revolution, with the Russian Revolution, with pretty much any revolution that I know of. The American Revolution, perhaps, we can argue. And so uh, the cost for me is so high, and many of those elements remind me so much to regimes like Nazi Germany that even though I sympathize with the goals and, and the ideals of Transhumania, I'm not willing to walk that path personally. Well, you know, this, this cuts to the heart of the, of the matter with how far one is willing to go to uh, achieve the goals of transhumanism and achieve the goals of immortality. And ultimately, you know, as, a, as an author, my job was to try to paint a story that would show how far the, the, the moral capacity might need to be of somebody trying to live forever rather than dying. And, um, and that's why I take it down the road. I mean, I'm completely with you having been to a number of war zones, uh, that, you know, it is a bloodthirsty monster and oftentimes the shift of power doesn't make a real difference for the general populace. They, they get shafted one way or the other. They're in trouble, you know, and, um, and I've seen it. I've seen it as, as uh, different forms of government have come in and gone back to you later and said, wow, very little has changed, except you have new names. You know, in, in, of course, in the book, you paint it as an ideal. You paint it as such that, well, Jethro's knights, he's different, and his government is different, and which is one of the reasons why at some point near the very end, he gives up uh, all the power to go back to just being a writer and a philosopher because, you know, th- that's one of the great things about transhumanism is that all the power in the world will not buy you necessarily um, 
a, a ticket into the singularity or even immortality. Actually being near the technology is what's going to get you because sometimes the technology, as it's happening, especially in the singularity, is going to occur whoever is there at the right moment and kind of is, it, it's a contextual thing in many ways. And so I, I hope that comes out in the book as opposed to um, all the warring and all the uh, um, people dying and stuff like that. Uh, unfortunately, um, I don't really have another way to get uh, a society to change so drastically when many of the you know top transhumanists may not be here in 10, 20 years. And of course, there's cryonics and this and that. But the truth of the matter is that in the book, it seemed easiest to say this is um, a revolution worth fighting for. This is how far we may be required to go for our beliefs. However, I'm hoping that that is nowhere near the case. I'm hoping that we'll all stay on a path of cooperation. I'm hoping, as, uh, hoping, as you had just mentioned, that you know we, the, the book serves as a warning to the kind of things that we don't want to do. These are the reasons why we should try to embrace these things and move forward uh, amicably, um, hand in hand, sort of, per se, and, uh, and make these things happen just by um, you know, being peers and being colleagues. And I'm hoping that we'll never have to go through that. And uh, but, you know, I think for merit of a story and also for trying to demonstrate how far the morality may need to go. And as every revolutionary knows, um, and I've met many of them and through the things I've covered, they're willing to die for what they need to do. And uh, especially since death is on the line with what Jethro Knights is talking about. And you have to understand, he's also a character whose wife is and child have been murdered. And he he's, you know, has a lot going a lot to fight for. Um, that's ultimately why I put those things in the book. And, of course, there's going to be endless comparisons to uh, Nazi Germany and, and other places. But, you know, the reality is that Jethro Knights is nothing like that type of person. He never wanted any of this. What he really wanted to do and what I think all of us want to do and what all of us should work towards is um, working together uh, as peers and making the goals of transhumanism trans, you know, come to, to fruition without any kind of conflict whatsoever, and to do it as expediently as possible. And hopefully a cultural mindset can uh, come about where people just agree that this is a good thing. And, uh, you know, ultimately that's why the book was written, is to try to get people, uh, especially younger generation, on board to say, well, you know, we don't really want to go down this path, but these are the ideas we stand for, and let's just embrace them and try to do it right here in America and in China and in India and work together and one day we'll just be this great planet that uh, supports uh, incredible amounts of technology. Yeah, in that sense, I have to say I very much agree with you, and, and that's why I, 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 despite you know my disagreements and, and stuff like that, I very much believe that your book is a must-read for anyone interested in transhumanism, but even just broadly in the future of of, of, of our civilization, because you do very good job of painting the, the extremes, sort of setting the battlefield, if you will, setting the, the, the map. And, and then, you know, perhaps it's up to us to choose how far do we want to steer one way or another uh, based on sort of that lay of the land as you've mapped it out very well, I think. Uh, and so in that sense, I, I do recommend very much and will continue to recommend very much uh, the reading of your book. Um, one last criticism, and, and perhaps you can help me out on that too, is um, the lack of diversity in the outcome. You know, one of the reasons why I love transhumanism is that um, I believe that it allows for greater diversity than we have ever experienced or ever had in our civilization. Um, and yet, in some ways, it seems to me that the final outcome in this book was rather homogeneous in the end. Is that a fair criticism to say? Uh, I fully uh, agree with you, and I think you know I I did that purposely again because for the um, you know the non-transhumanist that's hopefully going to be reading the book um, to take them and to try to convince them that uh, you know. Uh, an outcome like, you know, we all live, you know, our minds are now in skyscrapers just made of, uh, you know, wiring, this and that, is a little too far-fetched for them. My goal of the outcome was to try to create a scenario where 
people can say, hey, this is possible. We can live in a society that really cares much more about science, much more about technology, and still be ourselves. I, I am all about creating the weirdest and the most out there science fiction uh, scenarios. And believe me, I have a lot of them in my, in my head. But um, ultimately, I came down with a pretty uh, formulaic ending simply because I believe that's most likely what could occur with our society. And I also, you know, I want to stay based in reality. You know, I go through this entire uh, uh, story of this man trying to achieve this. And what is, you know, what he hopefully brings to pass is a society that has improved itself, that lives longer, that has less poverty, uh, less disease, and ultimately is probably quite a bit happier as well, and really looking forward to the future. And while that may seem a little mundane or, you know, at the same time, it's, I think, what many of us would really hope for um, in the next, let's say, uh, 20 to 30 years, which is the, the time frame that that could take place. Well, I myself very much hope for that. I just hope that, you know, we are able to do it in a way different than the one that it ends up being in the book. Uh, but as I said, you do a very good job of painting, you know, the, the extremes and, and mentioning the major philosophical and political and socioeconomic issues that we'll be dealing with. Uh, so, therefore, I do think that uh, it's very useful for people to read that book and, and perhaps reread it, too, by the way. Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, because uh, first it's fun as, as, as a novel. It's fun to read. You know, it, the pace kind of starts picking up and picking up and picking up, and it sort of reaches a crescendo at some point and the culmination. But at the same time, it doesn't fail to, to bring in all those philosophical uh, points of view, even Eastern mysticism and Zen Buddhism, if you will, and stuff like that through the character of Zoe, which I think was very valuable. Um, Zoltan, our time is advancing here, so we are getting to the point of my last two questions that I always ask of my guests on the show. So the first one is, where can people find more about you and your work? Perhaps where can they buy the book? Well, currently you can buy the book um, on Amazon, and uh, there's a paperback copy, and there's also a Kindle version, so whichever one you uh, prefer. And then I have a website that uh, kind of as a little description of the book. It also talks, you know, as a one page on just a blurb on the philosophy of the book, also uh, um, my background, and that's um, www.transhumanistwager.com. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and then personally, uh, you can just uh, find out stuff about me just by Googling Zoltan Eastvon and uh, often uh, slash National Geographic, and a lot of fun stuff shows up as well. Yeah, I would recommend uh, there's a bunch of uh, very interesting videos with your experience in Vietnam, uh, volcano uh, boarding, etc., etc., that are all interesting and, and, and worth watching. At least I enjoy them as part of my research for this interview. Um, now, we've been talking for about an hour or so, if people were to take the single most important thing for our conversation today, what would you like that to be? What's your final message? Well, I, I think most your audience is going to be, um, you know, people that are already familiar with um, transhumanism, the singularity. And so what I hope they would take from it is that um, there are so many amazing thinkers out there already. There's so many amazing scientists and there's so many amazing futurists. I, I would encourage everyone to reach out and try to support more of the artistic movement of transhumanism to gain a wider audience for the general public to um, come towards it because it's often art that serves as a, as a way to um, secure the future. If you look at a lot of different uh, movements and a lot of different things that have transpired um, kind of uh, stuff throughout the last 200 years, it's often artists that have been uh, played a, a core part in bringing new messages and new ideas, sometimes extreme ideas, to the forefront. And I hope uh, people out there will reach out to those uh, artists and, uh, and, and ask them to promote um, art that's uh, very transhuman oriented and that kind of uh, helps the overall movement. Would you have a couple of examples of such art? Well, I think there would be, it would be great if there were more novelists out there that were putting forth um, ideas. I also like the idea of um, new experimental art that involves technology itself, where, you know, instead of looking at a painting, you're looking at something um, that's not necessarily uh, 
technology in a functional way or something that we're going to use, but something that we're, it's, it's design is intended to promote how interesting technology and science can be. Uh, I would love to go into a museum where everything's just decked out in um, transhuman science, but not for the purpose of showing where necessarily uh, the scientists are trying to go, but in some kind of weird, eclectic way. What a fascinating and bizarre thing that might be. And, and these are the kind of things that I think that would bring the, the lay person into uh, transhumanism further rather than, you know, delving into kind of uh, science books or, you know, or having to read kind of heavy things like that. There are many other ways to tap uh, the, a new generation of people to think transhuman oriented thoughts. And uh, it's up to us as a as a group of people to try to find them and to find those people that can also touch those new people. Mm hmm. I think that's a great point to, to finish our interview and to ponder those last few thoughts. Zoltan Istvan, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Nick.